was down in Florida doing a theater gig when my agent went, oh, they called you back, but you're down in Florida. So I just told you you're unavailable. And I, went, oh. and I figured that was the end of it. Uh. <laughs> then, they then they called again a few weeks later, and I was available then, and that was the, the, the call back. And then that was just them wa watching me walk. They said, show up in cowboy boots. And then they gave me the address. And that's when I went, oh, my gosh. Because then I went, okay, it's Rockstar. And they want me to wear cowboy boots. This might be the next Red Dead. Not only is he so incredibly talented, but he is also so incredibly kind. He is the wonderful Roger Clark. Ah, hello, how's it going? <laughs> Better now. We've been yeah. like super looking forward to this. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. And happy new year. Woo! Happy new year. We made it. 2021. Yeah. We when did it. To stop saying happy new year. Like I I guess uh, February. February? Okay, yeah. cool. Is that when it is? I'm still That's, wishing yeah. people a Merry Christmas. So I should probably <laughs> calm down with that too. <laughs> but <laughs> Okay, so we have a couple questions for you, and I see that we're already getting some questions in the chat. Uh, so let, let's start with this. Actually, Danica, you go first. All right, so uh, we saw recently that you posted a monologue from Mackers. For those of you who are superstitious, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, of course, it was brilliant, and I absolutely love that play. I've been part of it in more ways than one, actually, over the years. And so my, my first question is, um, I guess, let's go with the entire plethora of Shakespearean roles since you've played so many. Um, is there a character that fascinates you the most? Do you have a dream role that you have not yet played? Oh yeah, thank you. I haven't done that much. You know, there's lots of, there's plenty that have done loads, but I've done it pretty much all my career. I love Shakespeare. and. Yeah, that's funny. Mackers, that's so funny because I'm not superstitious at all. And I'll say it. But You'll I, say it? I'll say it, no problem. Yeah, but I won't say it on here because I don't want to offend any of the audience. You know, you learn to, you learn to respect other people's superstitions, you know, unless mm -hmm. you just want to wind them up or something. You know. But uh, <laughs> but no, I I I I, uh, I love that play. And you know, one of the it's funny how with all the, the rumors and legends about theater and whatnot that go back and you learn where all that stuff came from. And, you know, there's loads of different stories about why that's unlucky to say. Mm -hmm. And you can say it when you're in rehearsal, but if it's out of context with the lines, you got to go outside, turn around three times, spit, spit over your left shoulder. <laughs> and I think it's the right shoulder, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, I've, I've, no one ever made me do it, although I should have done it a few times. But, <laughs> Yeah, to answer your question, I'd love to do the lead in the Scottish play. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah, that's how they get around it sometimes. They go, the Scottish yeah. play. Yeah. That's so, the one. Yeah. I'd love to be the lead in that because I was Macduff, the fellow who oh, yeah. was at the end. I was Macduff for like two, three years off and on with one company. And right. I just know that play backwards. So I, it's, I love it. It's one of the few plays of Shakespeare's that doesn't have a subplot. So it's just, it's just one story <laughs> straight, forward. straight through, you know? <laughs> It's got so much momentum, and it's just it, when it's done well, it's insane. Oh yeah, and all the oh, yeah. witches stuff too, which is usually really well done. Mm -hmm. and all that. So yeah, um, yeah. and I, I really enjoyed Shakespeare. You know, I, I really learned a lot about the dialogue and how to deliver it when you study Shakespeare and when you study the rhythm and beats and the thought that went into uh, his writing. Uh, you know, and the mm -hmm. vocabulary, which is bigger than almost any other playwright, I think. I think James Joyce comes oh, yeah. close, but like mm -hmm. nobody else uses as many words as he does. Not in English, any, not outside <laughs> of the English language anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do the lead and the Scottish play. I miss theater. I miss theater so much. Same. Well, yeah. kind of to follow up on that, uh, Danik and I really want to know what your experience was like working with Julie Taymor from Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh yeah, that was I'm, awesome. I'm such a nerd. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. Like, oh visually, visually, she's such a genius. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, people at home, Julie Taymor, she did uh, Lion King on Broadway, and uh, which is like a huge, huge success. She's, obviously, she's big. also done uh, Titus. If you haven't seen her version of Titus Andronicus, oh, it's a yeah. film with Anthony Hopkins, and it's brilliant. Um, yeah. And she also did. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. Um, there's another Shakespeare that she did recently. The one on um, film? Or? On film. 
Oh yeah, there was the the, the Tempest. Tempest, yes, that's the yeah. one. Um, yeah, but she also did across the universe. Like it, you know who she is, everyone. Yeah, she's so, so watch all these mm -hmm. things. But yeah, go on. No, she, it was I played <laughs> Beast Dance in Midsummer Night's Dream, and it was this cool place too because we opened up this brand new theater, theater for a new audience, which some of you may know is based in New York, very famous off Broadway venue, been going for ages because of uh, oh, Jeffrey Horowitz, amazing artistic director. Yeah. So anyway, I auditioned for them because one of my wife's friends dyes Tamor's hair. I shouldn't say she needs hair dye, but <laughs> so that's how he found out. I, the most, I mean, that's how awesome. how mean can you get? She just happened to be mentioning, oh, I got to cast this new play. I haven't started yet. I'm really freaking out. So he's texting my wife and my wife tells me I call up my agent. And before I know it, I got to I got an audition and I got to play Theseus. And uh, we did it at the new Shakespeare theaters, theater for a new audience, the Polanski Theater, which was one of these beautiful brand new theaters in Brooklyn, uh, right by BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music mm -hmm. and the Opera House and all that stuff. There's this beautiful space. And we were the first production. We, we, were, we, we, we popped the cherry on that venue and I <laughs> the first line on that stage. Wow. Yeah. That's it amazing. was wonderful working with her, you know. She is, you know, it's amazing. What I love working with directors that know what they want, and you know, and, and visually, she knew exactly what she wanted, and she came up with such beautiful imagery on stage, and she just knows what she's doing. I mean, obviously, I, she's got a lot of training in puppetry, but oh, yeah. as far as lighting is concerned, and 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 she set costuming and sets, she knows yeah. Her yeah. Stuff, uh, she knows her stuff. Mm -hmm. And that show sold out. We had we, an amazing cast. We had about 20 kids that were playing all the fairies. Mm -hmm. The backstage was insane. <laughs> and I had this uh, oh, cool. I had this kind of matrix style cloak and thing. I looked almost almost like Keanu Reeves, except maybe 20 pounds heavier. <laughs> you are the one, Neo. <laughs> so I have to ask, because you were Theseus and it's you know, being midsummer, that character is, I mean, he's kind of a Douche, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a way to put it. I mean, to put it gets better about by the end, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's still like marrying his captor, but it's fine. Yeah, um, no, it's his, his captive. Oh, it's, no, it's fine. No. Um, but it, if I'm trying to think of a, a way to put this, but um, because Theseus is one of the more straightforward characters in that, you know, he's not one of the surrealist like imagined character beings. No. Is there is there a hard juxtaposition going between you know seeing all these the fantastic creatures and and characters that are run around that you've got? Wow, that's an <laughs> um, awesome question. And to be, to be it wasn't it wasn't at the beginning. You know when he poses the ultimatum to uh, mm -hmm. is it Hermione? I, I forget. Yeah. Hermia, Hermia. When he gives Hermia her ultimatum, either marry this dude or go away. It's it's not so much an issue. What you just mentioned wasn't an issue then, but at the end of the play, when they're all getting yeah. married together and they watch the mechanicals play, yes, you're right. There is a bit of a juxtaposition because there's this guy who's like, "You're gonna die if you don't do what your father tells you," <laughs> and then within the space of maybe two and a half hours, they're all happy and having a lot of fun. Yeah. But you know what? I think so much, so much uh, suspension of disbelief has already happened by that point in the play. I think maybe that's the last thing that they're thinking about. But you know, you're absolutely right. And the way I played it, I just, I just, I just had fun. First, I, I was just trying to make fun of the mechanicals, but then halfway through it, I kind of got it and kind of really enjoyed right. it. So that was the way we kind of did it. And of course, it really helps when your mechanicals are awesome. Like uh, oh, our yeah. was played by uh, Max Castella. Who you might remember, he was the dude who climbed into the window in Doogie Howser. Remember that? Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, 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 from Doogie oh, Howser. Oh man. And, you know, he went on and had a fantastic career after that, too. You know, he worked a lot with, uh, uh, oh gosh, oh, what's the Jewish Italian actor with the curly hair who was in The Night of? Turturro, John Turturro. Oh, John Turturro. Oh. Him, yeah, Max and John Turturro have worked on stage a lot together. And then you see he does a lot of he's in the he does a lot of stuff for HBO as well. He was in The Sopranos. Yeah, great career and a great he was a great bottom. So he made that scene very easy to watch. One of my favorite jokes about Midsummer is is exactly that of like, well, I I bet he ha I bet he his is a great bottom. I bet he's a great bottom. <laughs> he was great. Yeah. <laughs> He did a total Brooklyn, you know, like a puppet. <laughs> he was like Mario. Um, no, oh, man. No. <laughs> but he was, you know, 
He was an Italian plumber anyway. <laughs> So I just want to point out that there's people currently watching from all over the world. I see someone is watching from Denmark. We have someone from Iran and they're wow. up in the middle of the night. You guys, thank you so much for yeah, tuning in. Yeah, this is awesome. I, I mean, thank you. Thank uh, you for being with us. I'm constantly <laughs> bl I'm blown away by this. You know, there's some awesome Red Dead fans in the world and they are all over the world. I'm not lying. I mean, there's <laughs> always someone from Iran. Hi, Salam Alaikum Persia. You guys are awesome, Aww. man. Thank you. And Denmark, man, this is nuts. <laughs> and I, I like how yeah, those are Russian fans, Brazil, Brazilian fans. But the Brazilians are hardcore gamers, man. <laughs> I mean, so I, I guess let's kind of transition into that because people are yeah. saying that they stopped playing Red Dead 2 in order to watch the stream. And we appreciate it. You can get back to your game after. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm seeing a couple of people ask, and, and I'm hesitant to ask, but people are asking, will there be a, a Red Dead 3? This is what I'm seeing, and I'm just I'm I'm just repeating what I'm seeing. Just the message. Of course, right here. yeah. I mean, everybody asks that, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyone who enjoys the first two asks that. You know, the answer is I have no idea. You know, I have no idea. They were usually mm -hmm. the, the actors are usually the last to know. I wouldn't be surprised if there will be eventually. You know, it it, it certainly has become a franchise that's uh, adored. So I wouldn't be. You surprised. Don't say. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, all I would say is that I don't know. Yeah. And even if I was working on it right now, I would say the same thing. I, would say, <laughs> I don't know. Fair enough. But I, I think Adored is almost an understatement. I feel like this game is like, just has conquered the world. Like it's like, the, we were just saying, people are playing it everywhere. I wanted to know, what was your audition process like? And how familiar were you with motion capture? Right. So uh, I auditioned in New York. And uh, yeah, my legit agent got it, and she had known that I had done mocap before. So to answer your second part of your question, I had worked, I had done mocap for one video game before, before Red Dead Two, uh, and uh, that was that was like maybe four or five, six years before then. It was probably in oh seven oh no, two thousand and nine, I think. It was around late 2000s. <laughs> Between 2007 and 2000. Yeah, we got yeah. I think it was 07, yeah. actually. I think it was 07. And it was for a game called Sh uh, Shell Shock 2, which was loads of zombies in Vietnam. And uh, that was in the UK. And that was my first foray into mocap. So when this audition came around, and it was, they, it, it was no, I wasn't identifiable at all as being a rock star gig. My agent just said, oh, mocap, you've done that before, haven't you? And I went, yeah, yeah, because I really l enjoyed it the other time. I, I was fascinated by it. Uh, so she sent me in for it, and it was weird because they didn't give you any sides in advance, which, you know, as you guys know, is not you, not very typical. Usually you get yeah. something to prepare. Right. But they specifically said sides will be provided at the audition. So I went, oh, okay. So they obviously want to see how good you are at cold reading. So I just made sure I had loads of caffeine before I got there. And, uh, <laughs> Is that the preparation? Loads of caffeine? <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah. The rapid fire buzz round, you know. Got it. I'm usually, I'm usually not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so yeah, I walked in and uh, it was uh, the, the producer and the casting director of that project, Tony Greenwich, and uh, that was the first time I met him. And I did the audition and. It wasn't a scene from Red Dead. It was, but it was uh, I, the writers did an Arthur type character, and they were just to see how how it came across. And I did it, and I thought it went really well. And then I was down in Florida doing a theater gig when my agent went, "Oh, they called you back, but you're down in Florida." So I just told you you're unavailable. And I went, "Oh," and I figured <laughs> that was the end of it. Uh... <laughs> they again. Then they called again a few weeks later, and I was available then, and that was the. The, the call back and then that was just them wa watching me walk they said show up in cowboy boots and then they gave me the address and that's when i went oh my gosh because then i went okay it's rock star and they want me to wear cowboy boots this might be the next red dead oh. uh -huh. that was when, that was, so it was the callback when i started to think and it was the weirdest thing because i just played the first red dead redemption like a month before this and i love it's oh, so funny <laughs> Yeah, oh, wow. totally loved it, totally blew me away, you know, and my wife, too. She was one of the few games that she enjoyed watching. And it's so funny because so many people say that to me now about Red Dead 2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they filmed me walking for ages <laughs> <laughs> and from, from the camera from the back. I mean, that's what the player is going to be looking at for mm -hmm. ages, too, right? 
fair, and, yeah. Yeah, and then they brought me in, and my first day on the job was August of 2013. Wow. And uh, do you remember how long the process took, start to finish? Because that five, had to be. Five years. <gasps> yeah. Wow. Almost, almost to the day, for me. For me, it was much longer for like designers and oh, yeah. producers and whatnot. But for me, five, I worked on it five years. Fairly, it was a little quiet to begin with. You know, we didn't hit the ground running at the very start. Mm -hmm. But once we were into like 2014, it was a pretty steady gig. Uh, five years. Yeah. I guess wow. it's similar to maybe six or five or six seasons of a TV show. What we put in the can. I mean. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I like this question. Um, I think the name is It's Nava. They wanted to know if there's anything personality-wise that you don't like about Arthur or something that made you face palm or feel embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so cool, yeah. To be honest, uh, no, you know, you got. I think you got to really love your character in order to do its service, you know, and I did kind of, me and the, and the writers and, and our wonderful director, Rod Edge, uh, you know, we kind of call create co-created him together by seeing the strengths and weaknesses. And anyway, yeah, you know, there was one thing I'll say about Arthur though that always still kind of makes me go to this day, mm -hmm. and that's uh, for I don't want to spoil put any spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert. But towards the end of the game, when uh, when Dutch abandons Arthur, and you see him, you see his feet. Anyway, it's under this this whole steam thing is shooting out, and you see his feet, and he's crying out for help, and you see the feet stop, and then turn around and walk away. <laughs> so when Arthur confronts him about this, the Dutch goes, "Nah, I did no such thing. Yeah, what are you talking about? You're crazy." And Dutch, and Arthur just decides to give him the benefit of the doubt. No, no, I would not do that. <laughs> I, mean, I would have stuck with him through thick and thin. You know, loyalty and goes a long ways. But as soon as I saw those pair of feet running around, I'd be like, no, nope, I'm no. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I like that comment. <laughs> Don't worry, Roger. I blasted Micah and avenged you. <laughs> well, well done. Well done. Better Good cool. job. Avenge him. Avenge yeah. him. <laughs> All right, next question that uh, you may get asked a lot, I don't know, um, is what type of accent preparation did you have to study for Arthur? Do you have a dialect coach for that or is it just all off the cuff? I didn't have a dialect coach, although I did. Uh, so I'll start at the beginning. Of the, yeah. So I was, I was actually working on Midsummers when oh. I started working. I started working with Rockstar whilst I was on Midsummers, And... Uh, one of my guys in my dressing room was from Flagstaff, Arizona. So I was, he was helping me. And so that's, <laughs> that was one of the areas where I really worked on. And I was working on West Texas too. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I noticed that a bit of Southern was slipping in every once in a while. You wouldn't have a, you know, he didn't, he didn't have as hard an R as the Texans mm -hmm. would. So it's more like Shaw and, as opposed to Texans where they go harder, right? Yeah. You know, the harder R, right? Mm -hmm. So I, it's a bit of everything, to be honest. So which, but at least, but I had to be consistent. So that's why I asked them to do it. It's just, you just help me listen back just so I want to keep it all consistent throughout the years. So there's bits of the South, there's bits of West Texas, and there's bits of Arizona. But I think that's okay because, you know, speaking from personal experience, you know, I grew up and I was born in Jersey and I grew up in Europe and my accent's all over the place. So I think Arthur's would have been too because he traveled around <laughs> from an adolescent too. Mm -hmm. So you pick up different turns of phrases in different areas wherever, wherever you're growing up throughout your development. So I just went for, yeah, I just, it's a bit of, it's in a bit of an amalgamation of all those three places. Plus, you know, a lot of people helped me with the consistency of it. And yeah, the, the sound engineers were great when that. They would go, hey, this is what you were sounded like a year ago. <laughs> All right, that's pretty much the same now. Okay, cool. Well, since since Danica and I kind of we love accents and we love talking about accents, especially Danica, is there maybe any other accent that you like to do? Well, I usually most of the ones I do, I hardly ever get asked to do anything in my normal voice. <laughs> but usually, I'm either uh, Western, uh, Irish, or British. And Which yeah, uh, is there a specific British? British? The British is the, my, my British ones. I usually get is I get the RP. I sound like the Queen's English, speaking like mm -hmm. the BBC Ooh. and whatnot. A lot of my audio books are done in British RP. There's not many British people who still sound like this, however, Ooh. because it's mm -hmm. way too maybe on the it's crowd. Too harsh. Yeah, <laughs> you, 
Yeah, and then I, I, I lived in Wales. I can do a bit of Welsh like if I want to. All right, but. <laughs> uh, I love it. England, where you go tit farm and get tit wife and shut the door. Huh? All right. Oh, you know, so good. I had to learn the Leeds United theme song for the soccer. One, one player did. <laughs> Are, are you a soccer fan? No, I like the no. international stuff. I like I like the World Cup, mm. and then I can do a bit of Irish too because I grew up in Ireland. You know, <sighs> most of even most Americans think I'm Irish now, but oh. it's, it's mild. You know, if I go back to Ireland, they would think I'm American. Yeah. Do you have a <laughs> Do you have a favorite Irish? Well, I grew up in Ireland, so I'd be sounding a bit like that if I really wanted to. You know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, up north in Northern Ireland, there you get a loaf of bread and uh, just talking like that fast, yeah. And I'm not too good at the Dublin one. The two roads, you know, not too. Not, yeah, I can't do Dublin too bad. Oh, these mm. are so good. <laughs> and then uh, don't talk like everyone talks a bit like they're asking a question, boy. Oh, yeah, you got to go up and add another octave, boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's all in Cork, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it so much. <laughs> Uh, so Samantha wants to know how has voicing Arthur impacted you? Ah, well, I didn't voice him. This is like this is the big. I, this, since Red Dead Two came out, I've learned mm -hmm. so much about you know the conception of how <laughs> performances are done in video games and whatnot. And you know, I, I had done. I, I I am a voice actor. I'm very proud to be a voice actor. Uh, but uh, I've also you know performance capture is totally different and it's funny you know because the gaming the performances in gaming like 20 years ago was all mostly all exclusively done in a booth you know and uh, the first time we really started to see mocap in video games i think was like maybe around the first mortal Kombat, you know mm -hmm. and but up until and everything around that that time was in a booth so you know they were voice acting it and then the animators would do they would start from scratch literal scratch but then more and more mocap got into it and then the technology got better and better and then it became performance capture and the difference being is performance capture you're recording audio motion and face at the same time with your scene partners so it's very it's not that really not that different to film at all and it's totally different from voice acting so arthur wasn't voiced maybe about 10 percent of the entire game was done in a booth for me but ninety percent of it we did in a in a performance capture volume, you know, with a set and a crew and uh, you know, co costume was pretty easy because we all we always wore the same thing every day. You got this helmet with a camera pointed at your face, <laughs> and then you it's lycra. <laughs> you know? Ooh, yeah, yeah. So I had to picture a lot of cowboy stuff, but that's where the animators would come in really handy too, because you know what. One of the differences that a performance capture set is to like a film set is that you're working with animators as much as you are the director because they're telling you so much that you need to know. They're the ones who can show you the actual environment that you're going to be in because to you, it's just the volume with some scaffolding. But then they show you what it looks like on in the computer world and then you're like, oh, okay. And so all those little details, then that starts to inform your performance and whatnot. And then you see what you look like too. And that's a huge deal as well, you know? It's, you that has to be oh. crazy. Yeah. How, how, how soon after finishing, um, after those five years, did you see yourself first with everything completed? Oh, I saw them already completed whilst we were still working on them. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, for most of the project, actually. I mean, he did changes did come along and and certain things got more defined and more detailed but i had a pretty good idea of what arthur looked like very early on in the project and then you know everyone does the same thing because you walk in and then you see yourself on the big screen and you're like when you move your right hand it moves its right hand and you just stand there for like 10 minutes just <laughs> is that and yeah, and I, I saw for five years, every every noob that would come in through the door that I was filming with the scene that day, they would all go, wow. Oh, I would totally do that. That sounds <laughs> amazing. I know. Every single morning. <laughs> every single morning. We actually started scheduling because of it. We'd be like, okay, well, that's going to be five minutes first where they just watch themselves. <laughs> I was going to say, one, one of the cool things that, I was just reminded of it's one of my friends like actually had the opportunity to work on the project. His name oh, is Josh, Josh Noble. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I known him 
you know, through the theater Josh, scene. He got to work. Josh, no, the, the, is he a song and dance fella? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Right? He plays yeah. Gaston a lot. He's been a lot of great recently, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, amazing. Oh, he's been a lot, actually. I remember him, yeah. He was in yeah. a fair amount because he was, I mean, he's a great actor and he did that regional, that regional dialect so well, you know. So he was in on a lot of stuff, especially in uh, certain, you know, certain parts of the game like Saint Denis and Rhodes. I remember they, we used him a lot. He was awesome. Oh. Oh, yay. That makes me so happy to hear that. I hope he's watching. If he's not watching, Josh, tune in. Uh, so a, a couple more questions, uh, and then we have some games that we want to play. So, okay, what is your favorite Western or spaghetti Western film? Oh, uh, yeah, I get asked this a lot. I like. Uh, I think my favorite's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is my favorite. Oh, my, my dad introduced me to westerns, but he introduced me to all the older ones, the John Wayne ones, mm -hmm. and stuff like High Noon and Shane. Mm -hmm. Shane was his favorite western, which was a really good one with Alan Ladd. But then, you know, just to be young, I was young and being, a, I just rebelled. And I went, I like the spaghetti westerns. I like Clint Eastwood. He's better than John mm -hmm. Wayne. So I like the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I love all westerns. Yeah, all the good. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many good ones. So, Queen, uh, so a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, going in a sort of similar but different direction, um, you've mentioned that at one point that inspiration for Arthur may have come a little bit from Toshiro Mifume. Um, oh, yeah. So which roles of his would you say best epitomize this? Is there is it more about particular moments uh, and or are you just a Kurosawa fan in general? Do you have a favorite Kurosawa film? Yeah, I'm a total Kurosawa fan. I, I have all of them, but I have never I've only seen like the most famous ones. But the roles, Toshiro Mifune was a huge influence for Arthur, you know, because uh, I liked the way he could be so stoic at times. And then at other times, you have quite a funny sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, the, it really shows. I, I think it's really clear. It's great. Yeah, cool. Thanks. My, but we're in, the biggest Mifune inspirations were the uh, Yojimbo and uh, Sojiro, which is eventually became Fistful of Dollars and for a few dollars yes, more. Right. Uh, so he's putting, and it also kind of happens in Red Dead too a bit, where you, you got the two feuding families in Rhodes, yeah, and yeah. That kind of pits them against each other, which is almost a very similar plot line to mm -hmm. both sets of those of those sequels. But so yeah, Toshiro Mifune in uh, Sanjuro was a huge, huge other thing. Awesome. So, so I have to ask because of your love of of the Scottish play, have you seen? <laughs> Yeah, Throne of Blood, yeah. Of blood. Oh God, yeah. God, it's so good. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the other things that I think definitely should be noted is that you've performed in over 40 countries. Is this true? Because that's insanity, Roger. It's a lot of countries. Yeah. And <laughs> is, is there something that you can recall that sets theater apart in certain places and maybe one thing that you would find to be consistent in all different countries? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Like, well, I remember we were touring. Uh, we were touring a stage adaptation of Frankenstein for a long time, and we were in France for like a month. And uh, then, then after a month of France, we our first night in Germany, and we just bombed. And uh, we were just like, we were like really puzzled by that, you know, because I mean, we were like, we thought we were just everything was clicking along and moving along nicely. And but then you know, it's just it's a different culture, it's a different sensibility. And then we started to get the, you know, you, you learn to start listening to your audience. And luckily in theater, you can do that in real time. I mean, if if you're going away and you can tell it's not working, you can change on a dime and then try and win the audience back. You know, you can't do that in any other performance medium, you know, but only in the live ones. So like we started, yeah, the French liked a bit more comic. They liked a bit more kind of, you know, kind of comedian stuff and uh the, but the germans were really into the horror of it you know, so they, they didn't want to laugh i'm shocked so. <laughs> <laughs> i'm german yeah. i can say that it's fine <laughs> china when we did the, we brought the scottish play to china and uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the audience were went there because they wanted to practice their english and, you know but when we were like shakespeare isn't really modern day english so they go, it's okay. i don't know but there's this one line uh lady mcduff is angry because there's her husband's up and left and she doesn't understand why so she's angry at him and she's complaining about him to one of their children and the kids goes well what are you going to do if he doesn't come back 
And she's like, well, I can buy me, speaking of husbands, she says, I can buy me 10 at any market. And the Chinese thought this was hilarious <laughs> because the whole thought of a woman by like having her choice of husbands was actually quite darkly true in a really fucked up way. <laughs> Chinese women were getting abducted from villages to be married. Uh, there's, there's a shortage of females for a certain portion of Chinese generations because there was, they remember mm -hmm. back in the 80s, they weren't allowed yeah. you, had, you had to have a male child and that was it. Well, no, right. they, they, <laughs> you, had, you got into a higher tax bracket if you mm -hmm. had more than two kids, mm -hmm. I think is what it was. And then, you know, so male childs were preferable. I think that's what it was. God, I hope, I hope I'm not. <laughs> anyway. I think I'm, I think I'm dark. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So, Danica, why don't we each ask one more question and then we'll go to the game stuff. Cool. Okay, so you want me to go first? You want me to go? Yeah, no, you, okay. No, you go. Okay, so you've narrated multiple books or multiple works by Max Brand. So for you, what would you say is the most challenging thing about narrating an audiobook? Oh, uh, the hardest thing about narrating an audiobook is anytime there's a conversation with more than two people. Ooh, I bet. <laughs> then you have the multiple personalities. Yeah, because yeah, it'd be like total, yeah. Yeah, just trying to, try to keep track of all the different voices and to try and make it clear to the listener too. I remember one of my book, one of my earlier books, I it was, uh, I had to do, there was five people, one, a Scottish bloke, a French woman, a Turkish dude and a Greek dude. And they all walk into a bar. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had, I had to convey this conversation and I had to, I'm stopping, starting, constantly checking who's saying what now. I was, yeah. For me, it's, you know, also, if it's badly written, it's hard to narrate, too. That's why Shakespeare mm -hmm. is so easy to remember, even though you wouldn't think it is. Mm -hmm. It's such, you know, uh, you know st highly stylized language mm -hmm. for today's listeners. But Shakespeare is actually really easy to memorize because it just, it's just flows. It flows but, so, yeah, yeah. But if, if something is badly written, it's really hard to get out of your tongue, mm -hmm. you know, really hard. <laughs> So then my question is, do you also listen to audiobooks? No. And, no. <laughs> nope. Pass. I, okay. I don't have enough time. I do listen. I'll, I'll like, oh, someone pe keeps saying, oh, he's really good. I'll like go and listen to his free sample on Audible. <laughs> have you there found you any, any other narrators that you're like, oh, yeah. If I, if I had the time, I'd listen to one of their narrations. Stephen Fry is great. Uh, oh yeah! Oh yeah! He, nice he 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 did the British Harry Potter's, and they were some mm. of the best audiobooks in in, in publication. Mm. And uh, Scott Brick's pretty good too, and yeah, mm. I know a lot of great. You know, there's some uh, Gabby Feldman's great. Yeah, you know. mm. awesome. All right, so we had asked you before if this is okay with you. You said yes. <laughs> so no taxi backsies. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna have you, if you don't mind, because we just think you have the most beautiful, easy listening voice, and we literally think you could read the phone book and it would sound glorious. We thought uh, about having you do that. But <laughs> it's not the phone book. So we have three short blurbs, and we wanna see how you would interpret it, these short blurbs. I'm I'm aware of what one of them is. My husband who's producing this one picked of the other two. So we're not sure what they are, Roger. Um, can you make it bigger, Jude, so we can see it? Or is that as big as it's gonna, like, cause it's still pretty small on the screen. Let's see if we can, yeah, if we're gonna try to zoom in or if you can send it to him. I can, him. Read, I can read that, yeah. Okay. Is this a WWE wrestler? Is this one this of his? Is, this is okay. Scott Steiner. Okay, Scott Steiner. He had the big, massive biceps, right? They were pretty big, and he wore like the chain mail. Yeah, on yeah, I remember him. Yeah, and he had, he had a brother, right? I used to love all. Yes. That. I don't want. Not, <laughs> okay. All right. So this is why back in the Attitude Era, where they used to go, you know, the fact of the matter is, <laughs> and at the end of the day, <laughs> okay, you know. They say all men are created equal. But you look at me and you look at Samoa Joe and you can see that statement is not true. See, normally if you go one-on-one -on -one with another wrestler, you got a 50-50 chance of winning. But I'm a genetic freak and I'm not normal. 
you got a 25% at best at beat me. Then you add Kurt Angle to the mix. You the, the chances of winning drastically go down. See, the three-way at sacrifice, you got a 33rd and a third chance of winning, but I got a 66 and two-thirds chance of winning. Because Kurt Angle, no! He can't beat me, and he's not even going to try. So, Samoa so Joe, you take your 33 and a third chance, minus 25% chance, if he was going to go one-on-one, -on -one, and then you got an eight and a third chance of winning at sacrifice. <laughs> it's fat. Wow. I, 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 I think that. Then, before, I got this oh, going? How long does this go on for? Yeah, there dude, this is like the longest promo, and that's fine. I mean, I think, I think we ended I there. That was cool. Steiner math, and that was beautifully broken. <gasps> wow. God, Wait, what? Weird. Jude, what's this next one? Uh oh. Oh, this is. It, this looks like a Weird Al song. Okay, this oh, is yeah. a weird, weird owl. Oh, is this weird, weird owl? Yeah. Okay, which one? Oh, is it Yoda? It looks Yoda. like it. Which one is that? Which one? Is, I don't know which song is. Oh, it's uh, yeah. Lola. 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 Oh, oh, from the Kings. Yeah. I see. I see. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I had to, I had to run it through in my head, and I was like. I don't know how. Oh, the, Lola. Uh, I only remember how the chorus of that song goes. Okay, well, I don't have to sing it like the song. Do yeah, I? you can just read, read, read it. It's cold reading, not cold a cold reading. singing. <laughs> I saw the little rum sitting there on a log. I asked him his name. With a raspy voice, he said, Yoda. Yoda. Y O O D E A. Yoda. Yoda. Yo, 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 Yoda. <laughs> I've been around, but I ain't never seen oh a guy who looks like a Muppet, but he's wrinkled in green. Oh, my Yoda. Yoda. <laughs> it was like Irish William Shatner, and I love every second. <laughs> oh, Jude, you really put this one as the third one? Oh, my God. Okay. he. <laughs> this is a commercial. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, here we go. No. <laughs> if you or a loved one was diagnosed with methocelioma, <laughs> sorry, I said that wrong. It's if okay. you or a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Mesothelioma is a rare cancer linked to asbestos exposure. Exposure to asbestos in the Navy, shipyard, mills, heating, construction, or the automotive industries may put you at risk. Wow, that was. They're going to use that now. I mean, how could you? They better not. not. They better Ooh. not. Hey, no. I'll be right on it right now. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, never, man. never. Okay, that was music because you didn't hear me laughing under the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is not appropriate for a cancer treatment. Commercial. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, okay, so we have part two of a game that does not involve cold reading. So this is a game of would you rather? And all you have to do is pick which one you would rather prefer. And uh, all right, here we go. So the first one is would you you rather, I don't know, Danica, are you seeing the screen? I'm not seeing it. Not yet. Hold on. There it is. Okay. Okay. Would you rather always speak an iambic pentameter or always have to monologue to a skull? Oh, gosh. You know, I think I'd uh, always monologue to a skull because at least I could hide the skull off, you know. But if you always had to talk in iambic pentameter, that's just people would start getting sick of you. But if yeah. you have monologues to skulls, you know, I could like, <laughs> I could make sure I could pre put the skull somewhere where nobody could see it. <laughs> you hide the skull in a front. Right, and then it doesn't look as weird. They wouldn't go, why do you always do that with I mean, he always talks alone with a skull. Do you know what I'm <laughs> You know, Roger, the skull guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Next one. Would you rather live on a ranch with Clint Eastwood or live on a ranch with Doc Brown? <laughs> Oh, uh, that is a bit hard, but I, I, I think I'd have to go for Doc Brown. You know, <laughs> that sounds like a like Clint Eastwood's great. Don't get me wrong, but he can't, he can't build a time machine. Ah, uh, 
you got the train. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. I'd yeah. Say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather do an audiobook narration for a children's book or a narration for a true crime novel? Ah, well, now, this is totally professional. This is just total being a boring professional. I'd obviously go for the true crime novel because it's longer and there's more chance of there being a series, so it would just be more money. But <laughs> books are so much fun, though. They are so much fun. Nobody's ever asked me to do one, funnily enough. <laughs> Yet. Yes, but the yes. true crime stuff, yeah, the true crime stuff is, yeah, that, that's that's usually a bit more juicy and, well, just usually they're bigger projects, you know. Fair. I, I wrote a children's book back in high school that I could have you narrate. It is all in French, though. So. Oh, cool. It's probably less than an hour long, too, right? It sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Six pages. All right. Here's the next one. Danica. All right. Would you rather ride through the desert on a horse with no name or ride a steel horse wanted dead or alive? Oh, uh, I'll do the desert. Yeah, I'll do the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at least then I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be wanted. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Would you rather, ooh, okay, forget a line or have a wardrobe malfunction on stage? Okay, well, does the wardrobe malfunction involve nudity or genitalia or whatever? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to. Oh, no. okay, well, I'll go for the wardrobe malfunction, yeah. Because then that you can blame the dresser for that. But if you forget a line on oh, stage, it's on you. <laughs> But if, you know, if, like if you have if if a thing falls off your costume or whatever, you could just go, "Damn it! It's the costume designer's fault." <laughs> I know a few people who would be very upset at that. Okay, next uh -huh. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you always rather always have to wear a cowboy hat or always have to wear chaps? Cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, you're, it's more acceptable in more situations. I think. Uh, yeah, I'd say that's fair. Unless you're Shawn Michaels and then you go with the chaps, but those are yeah. Yeah. totally different types of chaps. All right. Would you rather, oh, marathon read a J.R.R. Tolkien series or marathon read George R.R. R. Martin? All right, I'll tell you what, I've done Tolkien so many times. I'll do R.R. R. Martin because I haven't actually read those. No? Did, no. did you Did you watch the show? Yeah, yeah. Really liked the show, but you know, I like a lot of people. I felt it could have ended better, but you know, it still blew me away. You know, but I thought it ended a little quickly. You know, then I guess yeah. I've, <laughs> I've marathon read the talk like almost every year of my teenage years. I read The Lord of the Rings like once. Nice. So I've I, I'll do R.R. Martin because I know those are kind of different from the TV show too, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, he hasn't yeah. even finished the books yet, has he? I don't know. What is this? I mean, for God's sake, look at what 2020 has been. <laughs> I know. It's a time. All right. Next one? Next one. Is this? Oh, this oh, is the last, last one. one. All right. Would you okay. rather have to eat barmrak with every meal or eat dishreen with every meal? What's dishreen? Blood pudding. Blood pudding. Oh. <laughs> uh, and bar what's barmrak? So think of... Um, so these are both Irish dishes, but so bombrack is um oh, is you, bread? I've it's never the heard bread, of but most of the time it's like got raisins and and weird dishreen dishreen's called black pudding in Ireland. Mm -hmm. black, black pudding, pudding, right? Yeah. Bombrack is that like a sweet kind of cake? Uh I don't know if I'd call it sweet. Is it, like it has soda raisins. Bread? <laughs> is it soda bread? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But but Look with like raisins. Soda bread. It's soda Eat. bread, but with raisins and weird shit in it. Oh, okay. You know what? I'll have them both, man. I love them both. Uh, yeah? Yeah, I, I, love, I love black pudding and white pudding. I love it. Do and you I have like I love soda bread too? Soda bread fun. is fantastic. I will I will agree with that one at least. <laughs> is there like a traditional Irish dish that you really enjoy? Uh I just I, I do like the good old fashioned uh, breakfast fry up. You know, mm -hmm. which you'd have definitely would have the black pudding on that, and white pudding, and then bacon and baked beans and mushrooms and tomatoes and the only different, the biggest one of the biggest differences, and then the British, the British uh, breakfast fry ups are awesome too, but they don't oh, usually they don't have black pudding. You know, they might have the rashes are slightly different. But, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Crazy. So, Roger, before we wrap this up, is there any final thoughts you want to leave us with? I also want to mention that you are, of course, on Cameo. And 
I mean, I think everyone should definitely take advantage and, and book a cameo because Roger's yeah. cameos are fantastic. And that's why he has all those five stars. But any uh, final thoughts you want to leave us with? Oh, the, the, yeah, the fans are so amazing. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. I will say I, I do produce a line of audio books like Kid mentioned earlier. Thank you. Uh, if you go to payhip.com forward slash unbridled audio, all one word, I do a series of audio books written by a fantastic author. Uh, author, sorry. <laughs> I was <laughs> a fantastic okay. West, uh, author of, uh, of the Western genre, a guy called Max Brand. Uh, and, uh, you know, t tune into that uh, website and you can, uh, you can check out some of my own audio books. And thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. This has been so much fun. Uh, Danica, before we wrap it up, you want to go over our upcoming guests that we sure. have? Let's play. So our next guest is this Thursday, January 7th. We've got Chris Hansen. Uh, <laughs> the thing that we did before? Oh, did yeah. The, the so, okay. sure, sure. So Chris Hansen is uh, a NBC. Uh, I guess we'll say he's he's a reporter. And yeah, just, just tune in yeah. Thursday. Okay. Uh, and then on Tuesday, the 12th, we have Jimbo. Jimbo is from Canada's Drag Race. Thursday, January 14th, we've got the wonderful Glenn Sobel. He is the drummer for Alice Cooper and the Hollywood Vampires. On Tuesday, January 19th, the fabulous Steve Gonsalves. From Ghost Nation. And then on Thursday, January 21st, Andrew Volpe and Tim Convy. From the band Ludo. And then on January 26th, Lucas Rossi and Icarus Bell. That one kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> and then uh, returning for another spot, we've got on February 2nd, Casey Jose From Impractical Jokers. He hosts Impractical Insider. And I think this last one. Yep. Uh, the last yes. one is, of course, the fabulous Corey Taylor on February 9th. From Slipknot and Stone Sour. Whew, we made it through. Oh, my goodness. Roger, you are so fantastic. Thank you so much. And I guess, you know, we'll keep saying it. Happy New Year. And we're Happy so New glad Year. that, that okay. you were our first guest for 2021. Oh, and, it's an awesome honor. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for asking. Of course. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Everybody, please be safe and wash your hands and wear a mask. And we're going to get through this. And 2021 is going to be exactly. a much better year. You're able to. Yes, absolutely. All right, guys. Bye. Bye.